Okay, so this is uh, interesting in so far as um, what we're looking at. I'm trying to find a pointer. I could use a I could use a good pointer. Let's try a big uh, paper clip. I should probably so what's interesting about some of these aspects now what we're looking at here is this figure in the back is an airfix uh, 176 scale figure and you can see that there is a difference noticeably when you put them next to each other they're pretty close right they're I guess they're almost the same in fact this airfix figure is probably in scale with these Eschy Germans now these are Eschy Germans that I've painted well this was these are really old okay these are green painted Germans uh, right here so they're painted Feldgrau, okay? So gray that's green that's gray or gray that's green. It's a green gray. And you can see that uh, these are old because some of the paint has either come off or it has chipped off. For instance, here it's chipped off. And this is a stand uh, from Litco uh, Aero Systems. This is a clear stand. And this is a... Uh, a round label that we've put on the unit which we actually would say is no longer needed because you could just as well draw on here with a black sharpie but this is very crisp and we printed a whole bunch of these on the printer um, so we had these round disc labels that went in the printer and printed them in laser so they came out really clear so this is the first squad third platoon a company that's the way it's supposed to read and you can see that some of the details are of interest uh, between the two manufacturing, the Eschi guys and this Airfix guy. So there are some similarities uh, enough that we can say these are usable figures. Um, the big difference that you can see right away is the rifle. Now. Um, who is correct in their sculpting here? I don't know. I have a feeling that I wish the Airfix figure would have uh, provided a better rifle um, only for an exaggerated use like the Eshi figure here. This rifle could be, is actually, uh, regardless how they're holding it, the... Um, Eshi uh, rifles are the better of the two. Now this is, um, you know, I haven't even got out the the figures from uh, Pegasus, the Russian, for instance. I don't think I have any Germans from. Pe I might have some Germans from Pegasus, and so I know I have Russians, of course. But this is the point. I mean, you can see. Um, that these guys are not decorated. Okay, there's no. There's no uh, typical uniform decoration that you would like to see, and there is no shadowing on these figures. They were These were painted years ago, and quickly to get them, uh, like a lot of things, on the game table as fast as possible. But the um, thing is, these were, uh, figures at the time were either a f very affordable and plentiful, and we just grabbed them. Uh, to put them in the game and, and painted them up. And whether or not they're accurate uh, is another story, which we will just go into. Um, the Airfix figure you can see in the back has actually pretty good helmet shape. And the guy in the front standing firing is also typically a pretty good German helmet. But the guy in the middle kneeling, his helmet seems to have been in the molding process a little washed out it almost looks like a paratroopers helmet uh, it's not quite exaggerated enough whereas the airfix the gray guy has got a uh, 
a really good a really good representation of the helmet and this is where the uh, airfix actually let me see if I can get a better um, I have to balance this guy let me balance him on another Let's see if I can get this to be a little bit better focus probably as good as I'm going to get it. Yeah, that's uh, that's about as good as I'm going to get it at this time. So, you can see what can be done with these guys. Now, let's look at this. Now that you've seen this, oh, and look here, by the way, is a very interesting uh, little like an Easter egg, if you will, in software. This German standing has got a potato masher hand grenade stuck in his boot. It's really creative, and I'm glad they did that. It's just really funky, right? I like that. And all these other accoutrements, gray, black, green, you know, tan colored. Who can say? They just always varied. Uh, it's good to be consistent as much as possible. So when you look at these two guys firing, who do you prefer? I prefer the Airfix guy, right? I prefer this guy back here It's a, that's in the back. I prefer the way he looks. He's holding the rifle actually perfect. And the Eshi guy, which is typical of Eshi back in those days when they cast these, when they molded these, they sculpted them. They always hold their rifles too high, or the arm is not high enough. The uh, guy in the back may not have his arm high enough, but he's holding his weapon properly in his, well, it would seem to be properly, in his armpit. The Eshi guy's holding it far too low. He's not tilting his head to look down the sight. Neither is the kneeling guy. This is a fault of all Eshi uh, molds. They never have the rifle held up to the face. Well, because why? They probably said, the sculptor in Italy or whomever probably said, we want to see his face. All right? But the truth of the matter is this gun sight, which is right there, amazing that we can see this, the gun sight should be very close to his eye level, right? Of course, because he's looking down the barrel. But they never are. Not, as, not in any era did Eshi do that. When they hired their sculptor and he cast or he sculpted all these he's all at once in all many eras, uh, they all looked the same no matter what it is. They all were cast in the same manner. They were all sculpted in the same manner. So that's that. But let's look at, uh, let's grab a uh, American. This is going to be both uh, Eshi and uh, Ravel. And, of course, the same caveat applies here. These guys were, at one time, applied to different stands. And they've been taken off and put on these Lico clear bases. Uh, which they're probably going to have to be pulled off and put on another one as well. Because of the fact that this is just showing its age. But the uh, the guys, of course, are in the, the typical wrong color green. But they're green. They're not brown. We, we can't have so many everybody looking brown in this game. Uh, you call it olive drab, but the fact is they look brown. Everybody looks like the color of the canteen here. Okay, so this doesn't work. That's why I painted these guys green. I want to see them green. The only fault I would say is, well, it's not a fault per se, but it's a, it's a, it's a reason for why things are the way they are. The guy in the back with the flamethrower should have, these uh, flamethrower uh, canisters, they're, they're metal. They should be metal. And his harness, of course, and the straps are not going over the shoulders. See, the, the, the uh, backpacks are just stuck on. There's no strapping going around because I didn't want to take the time to do it. And, that's, and hence, this is what they look like. So these guys are holding uh, the machine guns, the little uh, submachine guns guy in the back is holding a Thompson and a peculiar 
you know, shapes, of course, as usual for Eshi. These are all Eshi troops, I believe. Yep. So that's why, you know, they look the way they do. Eshi just had a certain, <laughs> a certain way of thinking. And, and, you know, they had their, their sculptor do it a certain way. And that's why these guys look the way they do. It's really interesting. Uh, of course, you know, these guys are all at some point heading toward the garage to be repainted. Let's have a look at some of the, uh, let's have a look now at the Ravel uh, American Infantry. You can immediately see there's a vast difference, hence the superiority of the Ravel sculptor uh, when they did this. These guys, uh, when they sculpted this, they put a lot of work into the wrinkling of the fabric. And as you can see, these guys used to be on bases that were flocked. And that's going to have to, well, I leave it the way it is now. But anyway, uh, aiming, uh, looking down the barrel of the Thompson, the guy in the front, the guy in the back is an Eshi American GI. And you see we've highlighted through the painting a little bit of the fabric folds. And he's doing okay, right? You can see he's looking down the bear. <laughs> he's looking, he's firing right at the camera right now. Uh, so that's okay, right? That's all right. Now that's an SG guy, right? That's, but look what happened. Look, when they elevated the gun, they took it out of his armpit. <laughs> so... <laughs> There is no way this gun is going to fire. When he pulls the trigger, the kick is going to launch the rifle uh, <laughs> behind him. It's going to he's going to drop it because it's not in his armpit. They still they just elevated the gun, but they didn't tilt his head. They didn't want to tilt his head. Anyway, so you get a good vision here of the Ravel submachine gun, the Thompson, the guy's holding in the background there. There's the guy with the grenade. He is just really going to whip that thing. All right, the pineapple grenade. He's going to throw that thing, and he's got one of those uh, burp guns that uh, officers carried. Um, well, by this time, I guess anybody would. But it's 1944-45, and, and Ravel sculpted this guy throwing this hand grenade, right? Really nice. So uh, much better uh, act action, you know, much better. So let's get one more. Um, here's an example Again, with Ravel and Eshi, uh, this Ravel guy's got a BAR and uh, overcoat, and it's accurate, okay, as so far as we know. And the guy in the back is an Eshi with a BAR. Nice, right? A couple of BARs in this group. And the guy in the back is reloading, again, looking like Battle of the Bulge, you know, sculpting winter. And uh, they're all accoutremented, uh, accoutremented very well. There's the bipod, the bipod of the BAR. Um, but sadly, because of the fact that uh, there's only so much you can get away with in your in your molding and your casting, the, of course the uh, the uh, bipod is not uh, distinct. And I think the other guy, the Ravel guy, doesn't even have a bipod on his BAR looks like maybe a different issue but anyway this guy in the back has a bipod on the BAR and his straps are coming off I should say loosened from his helmet so he's looking like a little a little bit more active kind of a guy but the guy in the uh, back here now looks like I think he's wearing a scarf around his head because of the winter it's cold right so I think he's wearing a is he cast with yeah he is see He's actually wearing a um, a headscarf uh, or ha um, f uh, fabric. What, what is it that they would wear back then? Underneath his helmet, and the guy in the back might be as well. No, you can see his ear there. But this guy definitely is molded uh, with that uh, that little cloth protecting him from the uh, from the elements. So this is an example of uh, you know two Ravel guys and one Eshi guy. So it's pretty good. These guys are. Uh, They've seen a lot of battle. <laughs> these guys have been around for a long time. I think I painted these, geez, I don't know when. Maybe 1980. And what are we now? 2018. So, long, 
long, long time ago. These were actually the Ravel guys. Nah, that's a little too early. These would probably have been 1990 that I painted these. That's what I would say. All right. So one last thing. Let's have a look at. Um, let's have a look at the mortar section. Two different, I believe, but they're still eschy. Uh, these would be the mortars. Um, one, the front guy is uh, eschy, I believe, and the back guy is eschy as well, but he's standing. So I'm thinking no doubt one is an 81 millimeter mortar. So they're not care, they're not using the paratrooper little 60 millimeter or 50 millimeter mortar, whatever it was. These guys have got the 81 millimeter mortars. These are larger. Maybe the one in the front now is less, and the one in the back is certainly a large mortar, 81 millimeter, um, something of that nature. And um, you can see again what the uh, the reality of molding, uh, of sculpting and molding in plastic. Um, there's the injection molding has limitations as to how you can show things and one of them is the simplicity that's needed to get it done in the bipod structure the tripod or bipod structure of the mortar itself and the guy behind of course is holding his ears oh uh, i don't know why i suppose maybe he's from an artillery set but the fact is uh if i'm not mistaken the mortars were actually not that loud uh you, you really uh unless you were bombarding and firing a whole bunch would you be that concerned uh, about the noise, uh, because literally we've all heard uh, pretty accurately on television uh, in movies and so on that the mortar makes a sound like thump, thump, because really it's just a bomb launcher. It's not making a massive explosion like a cannon. Um, so what's happening is when it fires that rocket, well, it's not a rocket, uh, when the uh, mortar round goes into the tube and hits the bottom of the uh, tube, it activates the explosive charge which launches the mortar round. And by Oh, by the way, this angle, <laughs> that's the other thing. <laughs> These guys are firing about like 10 feet away from themselves. These bombs are going really straight up, okay, like whoop. And it's coming down like somewhere over here. Uh, the angle should be something, you know, much more dramatic. It should be like that. Uh, well, the guy would be faced like this, but the, the angle of the thing should be here. Look at my pointer. This is why it's so funny. The angle of this thing, too, uh, should be like this. All right. I mean, he, he's supposed to be shooting like maybe five, 600 yards or something. And this this angle, he's shooting it like, you know, it's landing right here. <laughs> it's going up, and about 10 minutes later, it's going to come down right here. So that's kind of funny. Uh, they all do that. They all show the mortar incorrectly. A lot of the manufacturing, uh, nobody does it right. Nobody does it right. I mean, you look at photographs. Uh, maybe the guy in the front now is is probably a little more accurate. The guy in the back certainly is, is firing way too sharp of an angle. Anyway, so that's that. And you can. And I don't think I have any bazookas. Do I have any bazookas? I think I might have a bazooka. Um, yeah, I got one bazooka. Here's a Ravel bazooka. Seeing as I've taken the time to do this uh, this video, here's a Ravel American Infantry bazooka. Nice. It's a 60 millimeter bazooka, not a big killer, uh, and that's what they always complained about. This is a, more like a little pop gun. It would just go doink, and it would barely uh, take out a, a Panzer III. Uh, actually, uh, it, at the most, it could take out a Panzer III without extra armor otherwise these were just not powerful enough and what's interesting to note is that the germans copied this right the germans did not invent this this was made by the americans and the germans copied it of course they made it much more stronger and 88 millimeter in size and probably a shaped charge but anyway the panzer Schreck and the panzer Faust were much more effective than the american version uh so here's our revel commander well it's a revel radio person okay Commander, yes, because of the pistol and the binoculars. So this is the guy we traditionally kept as a commander leading uh, a symbol for the platoon. Um, 
and this is Ravel. Again, you can see the the expertise in the wrinkling uh, to show it uh, realistically, right? So that's what this is all about. And uh, the radio, good old Motorola radio. So that's that's that.